Hello, everybody, and welcome to this month's Sustainability Practice Group call. Uh, with that, I want to hand over to Mark to get going with today's presentation. Um, and from that, uh, he'll introduce today's speakers, and we'll get going with uh, today's call. Thank you, and over to you, Mark. Thanks, Matt, and uh, thank you for uh, attending those on the line. Today's session, as you can see on your screen, is selecting and tracking lead version for optimized products. It's presented by Brent Trenga, Chief Green Officer of Green Wizard, Wade Bevier, FCSI, Specification Writer with Smith Group, and Robert Finney, Director of Sustainable Design Services with HDR. I look forward to your presentation, and we'll turn it over to you, Brent. Great. Okay. Well, thank you, Grace, for the introduction. I, I really do appreciate everyone's time coming into the session today. Hopefully, we'll make this uh, informative and dynamic for everyone. Um, as we talked about, the, the session will be really focusing on transparency, um, both lead v4 overall transparency and the, this dynamic shift in the marketplace. So we're going to go through some introductions of our guest panel speakers, um, go in and dive into this product transparency lead v4 criteria. Um, present some of those topics from the speakers. Um, both Wade, uh, Robert, and myself will do a, a brief presentation, about 10 minutes. And we will also have a, a Q&A session at the end. So as those questions do come up, feel free to raise your hand or type them in the question box. We can ask those at the end. And then we'll do some closing comments. Um, so a little bit of a, an overview on the call of what we wanted to talk about was you know, given the importance of lead V4, the beta launch of E4, the inherent transparency things with EPDs, LCA, HPD information coming on the market, this is obviously combined and overlaid with, you know, multi-attribute certifications and how these are written into specifications and into the building process, layering on cradle to cradle and SMART and FCS and declare labels, living building challenge, lead. It's, it's really becoming a very complicated mix to evaluate research these products, write the specification, get them loaded into the projects correctly, and really kind of facilitate and deliver a project that, that's to the median goals to the client. Um, you know, it's becoming very difficult to get a, the granular attributes of these products or certifications to get to that level. Um, and this is a rapidly growing sector of the market. The building product industry is changing, has changed in the last 12 months incredibly to a much deeper level. The, Manufacturers are becoming very engaged with this movement. Um, this session presents strategies for attaining lead V4 credits, demonstrating how uh, there are software tools and solutions out there to help that, Green Wizard being one of them, which is what um, part of my demonstration will be tying back the comments of, of Wade and, and Robert to those topics. Um, and that being said, I want to uh, introduce our first speaker, and then we're going to end our second speaker, and then I'm going to go through a couple topics, and then I'm going to pass it over to Wade, who'll be presenting first. Um, so those introductions, obviously, uh, Wade Bevier works with uh, Smith Group JJR uh, as a construction specifier. Um, his specific experience focuses on writing construction documents, coordinations for healthcare, federal, mixed use, commercial, and education type projects, helping to coordinate the office master specs and documentation for Smith Group. Uh, applying the green and sustainable um, requirements for construction projects, LEED, Living Building Challenge, and other. Work, uh, Wade works to develop um, with the e-specs and Revit implementation planning throughout the firm, along with a project firm resource and construction building product analysis and recommendation. Um, so we're going to hear from Wade and appreciate him being on the call today. And our second speaker is Robert Finney, uh, Director of Sustainable Design Services at HDR. Uh, Robert's background focuses on sustainable design, high performance building consulting and construction, sustainable operations and sustainability policies, both at his firm and to the greater audience. Uh, working with both project management and program management level uh, interaction at HDR. Uh, before his current role over at HDR, also worked, it was a senior director of intelligent uh, integrated solutions for Skanska in their U.S. division. So obviously appreciate both of you guys for joining the call. Just a little bit of background before we, we dive into these topics is, in, so for those of us who are not integri integrally um, familiar with what LEED is and what, what a huge sway it's now pushed over the last couple of years, over 1.5 million square feet of buildings uh, space is certified by LEED every year. That's 147 countries across the world. That is a, mo a massive, massive number and a massive amount of construction development going on. Um, LEED has really driven the market. 
This is probably one of the most impressive slides I've seen in a very long time. This shows the trend in LEED certification in, up until 2012. Over 50% of the projects are earning a cert certification of gold or platinum. So the bar has really been raised. This is talking about V3, the 2009 rating system that we've all been involved in. Version 4 is really meant to raise the bar, and it needs, by this, these metrics, the bar needs to be raised. You know, we've met a, a very high threshold, and LEED has decided to, to raise it up, and, and let's see what, we, what else we can do with these buildings. Um, as you guys are probably familiar with, Living Building Challenge really takes one step above a LEED Platinum building. They really go into an even deeper analysis of building product selection, material, and transparency. But just starting with what we're already dealing with, this is the here and the now, is a really impressive number to look at. So. The timeline here, you know, V3, LEED V3 2009 is going to stay in existence and registration is going to be open through June 2015. It's not a mandatory shift over. Um, V4 is in the beta program now. We've got about 90 plus projects that are running through that system and testing it out. Registration is actually open now for voting. Um, I encourage all of you to, if you are members of USGC, to get in there and vote uh, at, per your preference of the system. It's really important. This is really changing where the market's going to go. Um, and part of that, you know, part of both the pushback and the advantage, depending on, you know, your point of view, is this disclosure, you know, this building product transparency issue that everyone's talking about. What does that really mean? The goal is really better product information to make decisions on all levels. Um, you know, it's a critical shift of some of these selections and why we're specking them, why we're using them, performance, health, um, the longevity, the sustainability of the products. Um, the transparency. There's a lot of third-party groups out there that are helping to disclose and to help to verify and certify this. Cradle to Cradle, SDS, Smart, Declare are, are some of the key ones, and those are really tied back to Living Building Challenge and LEED. Um, the Greater Whole Building Life Cycle Assessment, or the LCA documents, are being out there. They're really looking at the life cycle from, the, from cradle to grave, if you will, of the products. Um, the Environmental Product Declarations, or EPDs, you know, this is tied a little bit back into the LCA, but you know, product information looked at the embodied carbon, the embodied energy, and the embodied water of these products. And then taking this almost another layer down is this Health Product Declaration, or HPD. This by no means illustrates or conveys that this is a healthy product. We're just looking at the health attributes of the product, disclosing to a very, very granular level of what the chemical compounds are, what it, you know, not per, you know, parts per million, but part, you know, part of, per 100 of a, of a percentage of a, so we're really, really getting into a, a much deeper look into this. Part of that also goes into this red list of chemicals. The Living Building Challenge has put out 14 known carcinogen chemicals that they've put on their red list. So I'm sure a lot of you have already dealt with clients and projects that are calling out to be red list free of product information. So there's a lot of things to research, a lot of things to evaluate, and see what's going on here. So I want to talk about um, all of these in, in context of this discussion. Part of where myself and Green Wizard sits on this is we've really, as CSI, we partnered as a, a central hub and spoke of information. We are facilitating information from manufacturers and putting that information in a data-driven format, very much like the specifications you need to write, and partnered with a whole host of industry leaders, USGBC, Architecture 2030, IGCC, CSI as your team, um, as well as other product manufacturers, third party groups and product vendors as Cradle to Cradle and SCS, Declare, Vifma on the, on the interiors furniture side, Athena and Energy Star, all collecting and sharing this information. We're both working together with all these partnerships to get this information out into the marketplace in a usable format. So that being said, I want to introduce Wade Bevier from Smith Group uh, per that introduction, and I'm going to go over some of those talking points. Wade, I want to hand it over to you. Very good. Uh, I'm hoping everybody can see uh, I'm uh, in a remote location. I'm going to start with uh, a couple of items with regard to how to take the information that we're gathering and actually getting into our construction documents uh, with uh, the lead before 
there's some enhancements with the material contents and life cycle assessment credits. And so I've been working on uh, developing the language and the location for where to put the requirements and how to how to gather the submittals in such a way that the the actual contractor can be able to take that information and be able to execute it in a, in a way that the, uh, the project goals can be realized. Um, this is uh, involving getting the technical and the various administrative construction documentation all set up. I'm uh, working with a, uh, a, a group of other um, specifiers from national firms to try to see how we can coordinate this language. Uh, the other one that uh, Brett had uh, mentioned earlier is the living building challenge and they have a material pedal which is the uh, an enhancement of some of the requirements for LEED V4 and LEED uh, 2009 and so this too is, uh, is adding some additional information that will also be going into these um, construction documents. Getting the goals into the Division One and the technical sections is, uh, is somewhat of a challenge because each one has got a, a little bit of a different direction and, uh, and requirement as to what is being uh, asked for and, and how to go about uh, verifying and uh, coordinating that information. One of the tools we're using is the, uh, the Green Wizard Material Library and uh, we've been working closely with them to develop not only project specific libraries but also a, a universal library that as we gather information about specific products that we can actually have a, a storage place to be able to put them so they can be accessible at a later time. The other thing we've done is this is sent out a uh, material transparency request letter to the various manufacturers with which we've had a relationship with just to let them know what our goals are and how we need to get additional information from them regarding their products and this is where the HPDs and uh, some of the other um, calculating and um, information delivery resources are, are, are being developed and we want to be able to use those and, and make sure the manufacturers are A, aware of them and B, are aware of uh, what we're looking for. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Robert, who will expand on some of these ideas here. Thank you, Wade. Um, hello, everybody. Um, yeah, and along those lines, just uh, in, in, in a mode of transition here, um, HDR2 has recently developed a, uh, a way to advocate to manufacturers that our clients, not just our own internal initiatives and our feeling of responsibility within the industry, but our clients are asking for greater transparency and healthier materials out there. And, and that poses a, a big issue for us because of the logistics involved. It, it's not just, and, and perhaps obviously, uh, availability in the marketplace of these these areas, but as Wade was indicating, the difficulty is how do you best represent those in a project to make it move forward. So uh, it, it, from my perspective, this is a two-part issue that we need to deal with. Um, we certainly have a specifications team, but so much of the decisions that are being made out there, um, if we're pursuing LEED uh, V4 or Living Building Challenge projects or our own internal initiatives for healthy materials is how do you best represent that on the design side as well. And so for us, having some sort of consolidated and meaningful um, database to store this has, has many benefits to it. First of all, there's a lot of information as Brent was talking about out there. How do you sort through it? How do you vet it? How do you make sure that you're giving uh, complete knowledge and you're not uh, presenting maybe too much or, or putting your faith in, uh, in non crep in the same suit as I do? Some of the difficulty that we have in terms of enforcing this and providing quality to our clients is the consistency, in our case, across 185 different offices. Act as uh, some so simply because of the size of the company. How do we make sure that we are providing a consistent product and that we're giving the best we possibly can to our clients? And uh, and really the answer is is the creation of a materials database, something that we can share together instead of uh, separate libraries and different offices or 
um, databases that exist on local servers, something that's uh, in this particular case cloud-based, where we can uh, access it together, see the same information, um, not just the same information in terms of manufacturers and products to choose from, but the same information that's being presented in front of us so that we can then turn around and, and truly make informed decisions uh, for our clients. And that really is what our clients are asking for, either directly saying this is important to us or indirectly because they're asking us to pursue lead and, uh, and, and there's already discussion about how are you going to serve us best when lead V4 comes out with all of these additional requirements. So it's critical that we get on the same page and, uh, and find a way to codify it within our, our current documents um, and specifications obviously being a huge part of how we can enforce that and educate the marketplace as well. The, um, uh, it's one thing to collect information, it's another to be able to disseminate it and know that we're making that right informed decision. And so. The other part of this that uh, we're trying to work and develop here is that uh, is, is to find an easier way to make sure that we have all the necessary information that we need. So um, we certainly can get MSDSs from all of our manufacturers that we work with, but at this point, based on the V4 um, and the transparency requirements that we have internally, that's only about half of the information that we need. But how do we make sure that we, um, we're, we're getting that information out and, and our designers out there, all 2,000 of them, um, are asking the same questions? And part of that is making sure that the consistency and the clarity within the materials database exists. So um, ease of use has got to be a, a, a clear component of however we move forward. And that, in turn, will inform our specifications writers um, to make sure that they're doing uh, the job that they need to be able to do effectively for our design team as well. Now, in the end, um, what, what um, a database like that can provide for us, not just the ability to produce the right documents, but to be able to express to our clients that we're doing the best possible to uh, address the questions that they might have and the requirements that they might have. Um, at the same time, um, as many of you probably know that this kind of materials research with all the different standards and the lack of information out there can be a huge time suck and, and frankly we don't have the overhead budget to be the most effective along those lines and so um, finally in, in terms of the resources that we're looking for is an easy right in front of us already developed system that um, that have responded to the client uh, the, the market needs in this case looking for HPD, PD, cradle to cradle certification, so on and so forth, um, so that we don't necessarily have to take our time to do that. And the last thing I'll say, um, which I think is a critical piece, and I would hope that everybody on the call would agree um, that. It's one thing to have this at our disposal. It's another to actually let it evolve with the market. Because right now, there aren't many products to be able to choose from that meet all these standards. And we know that. But in any one source, there's probably more than what exists in that single source. So in terms of material health and these standards moving forward on V4 or in the transparency motion, we need to make sure that we're sharing this cross company as well. Um, we need to look less at proprietary knowledge and competitive advantage in terms of materials um, and start sharing it across the web. When we discover a, an optimal way to express within the specifications certain lead requirements, it's in our best interest and in Wade's best interest if we work together and collaborate and find that. Because he's going to find solutions and we're going to find solutions and together we'll be more effective. And at the end of the day, the, the actions that we take in that sense is going to be the market driver that uh, will, will help make this a uh, consistent and best practice across the industry. Okay.
I'm sorry. Drilling in, thank you so much for that, Robert. Um, definitely appreciate that. Um, so drilling in on some of those um, criteria, some of these talking points, I want to just take a moment here and go through the what exactly we're talking about. What what are these EPDs, these HPDs, and you know some of the resources. As I mentioned before, there are tools out there and there are resources that can make this a very easy selection process. Um, what Green Wizard has done on our side is provided a completely free tool for manufacturers to get that information into the marketplace. That is something that we are have very much been focused on is the transparency. And on the other side of the user base, it's a free tool to search for that information. So there's no uh, no cost involved for say for the manufacturers that have EPDs, HPDs, LCA data, red list material data, any of those criteria as a resource to get it out as a facilitator, a conduit out to the market. So for example, I just want to show you a little bit of what this would entail and what manufacturers can take advantage of. I'm just going to log in and search our system and pull back some of this manufacturer provided data. You mentioned how important it was for consistency and transparency. Our, our system is built completely of manufacturer provided, provided information. This is not provided by our tool in any way. So looking for that level of granularity, we can go in here and find search specifically for HPD documents, search specifically for EPDs, products that are known to be free of chemicals of concern, declare product information, no urea formaldehyde, um, the very specific criteria to write your specification sections on of writing a non-proprietary product for a certain VOC level. Um, so making this very easy, I can simply go in here and search by CSI division um, I'll go in here and thermal and moisture protection. If we do a very top level search to go out into our database and find information, you're going to get a huge subset of information. Nobody wants to search for every single top level 07 you know, thermal and moisture product out there and get 6,200 results of product information. What we'd really want to do is refine that search and go through every single manufacturer that has provided product information. That's enormous. That's really not the value here. We're talking about going down and saying, I need to find an insulate. I need to write a spec for a material that has no chemicals of concern. So we'll leave that same piece in there as a search and go in and find manufacturers that have provided this information out into the market. So we went from 7,000, 6,200 on a 7,000 product down to just 20. Robert, you specifically said it. What a very small subset of data this is. This is very, very hard to get your hands around. Once you have it, it's great to share and get to everyone's hands. But finding that level of granularity is very time consuming, and there's just not enough hours in projects to get that level of detail. So for example, we've got green fiber, one of the manufacturers, or Knopf insulation. You can go in here and find this information, view details and go in here and find what this is provided. Green Fiber has gone in, put their SKU number, their manufacturer data, product descriptions. There's performance data here at the top. There's green attribute information. This is free of all chemicals of concern. Manufacturing extraction locations, SCS certified, Energy Star certified. And then on the specifications, the project level, all of the supporting information that needs to be found and accumulated for this product to be written in and to be used on this project. So what I mean is, not only do we have the MSDS sheets, which, as you mentioned, gets us about 50% of the way, that's great. What else are we looking for? So as that pops up, yes, absolutely. We've got you know, material data sheets, but it's not giving us the granular level of information that we need that's getting us halfway. So we go down one level deeper here. We get their SCS certifications. We can get even their declare their VOC emissions testing. This product happens to be DECLARE um, certified. So it's got a DECLARE label showing that it's red list free of chemicals. It's been looked at by the LBC and showing what their criteria have they been evaluated for. So one place to make multiple decisions about, across multiple categories about that product or that information. That's just one example of searching on, on a specific criteria. We can go in and say, you know, HPDs, if there's 28 manufacturers that have involved in the pilot program for the HPD program, as that comes in, more and more manufacturers are trying to get that out in the marketplace. 
and there's our the declare label. So those that are participating in declare are loading that information out free to the marketplace to get into our site and or found by teams, design teams, specifiers, etc. So going out, we can say, you know what, I'm I've not looking for red list chemicals, but I'm looking for products. Maybe I'm looking for EPD documents. So I can go here and browse. And again, actually here we'll sh just kind of show, you know, high level, just looking and vetting the marketplace of what's out there. You know, we can go in here to finishes and we'll go into ceilings. So I need to find a ceiling title that's out there that has some level of information. I don't know, I, I always spec the same materials. What other options are out in the market? We've got 212 products, but I don't know if that's any different than what I'm typically using. So you can, again, as you can go in and find the search criteria or, sorry as that loads up, sorry my computer's running a little bit slow on my WebEx, I can search a whole bunch of different manufacturers or I can say I need specifically a product that's going to have an HPD that has a the ceiling tile that has an HPD. Searching that criteria for ceilings, any of those manufacturers that have that information, pushing it out into the market, now you've only got 14 options. So very, very small subset of data to come back and look at, and again, looking at, depending on what it is you're looking for, um, so we'll scroll down and find a couple different manufacturers. I can go in here and view this data. Again, provided by certain teeth ceilings, product descriptions, performance data, but we're looking at the granular level of this information, so the green attributes, the VOC content, no US, CA1350 compliant, no. It's got your certifications from third party groups. It's got your life cycle impact data. Certainty is trying to get this information to the marketplace. People that are looking for that level of detail on global warming, ozone depletion, ozone creation, that's really important to make an apples to apples comparison versus two products that may or may not have this level of information. So, and again, if we get into, they've loaded their MSDS sheets, their certification documents, and both the long version of their product declaration, but also the transparency brief. So it's kind of the short form version condensing on a 12 to 14 page report of information. Let's just get down to the very, very detailed part of what we need to evaluate. We're talking about LCA, VOC content, additional criteria. So this is very, very hard to aggregate and go out and search every single manufacturer's website looking at a database tool as we've talked about that to find information to make comparisons. It's collected in a data format. It's apples to apples across manufacturers. So you're looking at consistent, up-to-date, and vetted information directly from manufacturers. So all that information condensed down to one place on searchable criteria based on the performance goals of your project. So the information is becoming very, very hard to decipher. It's becoming very, very complex in the marketplace. Lots of different things. And as V4 unfolds, these criteria continue to evolve. There's lots of different things. What optimizes? How do we decide that there's an HPD with a third-party certification lead is giving you points for multiple criteria, combining and filtering those things on different attributes depending on what's going to give you the most deliverable performance on your project. So lots of different options, lots of different ways to decipher this level of information. Um, that's kind of what we wanted to show in terms of the demo portion of this. I think we've got about um, about 15 minutes open up to open this up back into a Q&A session. Um, so I'll like, jump back in here and move this over into a, more of a Q&A style. Anyone that's on the call that has questions, points of clarification, um, how this may affect what they're currently working on, any of those things, you'd be happy to take calls. Uh, I mean, obviously, you'd open up their the line and, and take a direct question or type something into the question box. Uh, Brent, um, Mark Kalen, is um, uh, where do you recommend people go to um, pick up the educational component that's behind this? Obviously, um, the terminology isn't familiar to everyone, and, and um, most people don't know how to read an EPD at this point. So. Um, is there a location, uh, 
a library location on Green Wizard, or do you just suggest people go to USGBC's website or CSI or um, Wikipedia? Uh, <laughs> it really depends on specifically what you're doing. For the HPD, um, going to the Healthy Building Network, they have a, a pretty good explanation of what it is the initiative is, this health product declaration. Um, they've done a great job of building both the beta test and now their version one form and collecting what that information really means, why they're collecting it, how they're collecting it, and what it means to evaluate products. You know, as we mentioned, there's it really depends on the user how they're what they're doing with the information. Are they just saying we need to find one or are they comparing one product that has an HPD versus a product that does not have that level of information? Um, so that's a great resource for the EPD verse side of it. Um, for lead version four, the USGBC has done a great job with um, kind of going through the US the new site that they've launched, USGBC um, new Dot org, I believe, is there, and they have a whole breakdown of what the, the changes are coming up in lead version four. Because we still are in the pilot program, per se, the, the program has not been fully adopted and fully approved yet. There are still some changes. They're in their fifth or sixth public comment, sixth public comment, I believe. Um, so there's a, a host of resources directly from USGBC that people can access on what the changes are, what the requirements are, the MR credits and the IEQ credits that are material-based have taken a, a much, much evolved turn. The credits themselves, the numbers have changed, the requirements have changed. Uh, but again, the, I, the caveat there is that it's not been locked down in black and white. There's still room for discussion and there's still room for, for change on that one. Um, are you aligning the, the physical characteristics that you list on Green Wizard with the uh, product category rules that are used in um, in in some industries we, or not we, have to, we are actually and just to clarify there are the PCR rules are not completely finalized um, they've just approved the, the PCR rule industry rule for concrete um, they've got one in development I don't believe it's been fully finalized for gypsum board um, it, it's there these are in development there's kind of a, a long process involved in this as those begin to roll out and are adopted and, and fully baked if you will we will be aligning those criteria directly into our application as well those will kind of set the industry-wide standard to say this is the industry you know break-even point or baseline for gypsum board how does this product compare against the industry you know the PCR rule for that particular product category um, do you know if anybody's, um, I don't know whether UL or Environment or is anybody keeping a master list of product category rules? It seems like it's different in each uh, industry. To my knowledge, and Wade and Robert, please weigh in if you know different, I don't know of any kind of master directory. Architecture 2030 um, has done a great job of collecting some of this information and help try to push this initiative forward. Um, but as I mentioned, there really are no set PCR rules other than concrete, to my knowledge, that, was, that have actually been publicly, you know, gone to market. You know, one thing, this is Wade, uh, the uh, CSI is working on a, uh, their green format and getting it updated, and they are looking to uh, develop a tool that can be used as we get consistent language and a consistent way of where to find information so that it'll work in conjunction with all these other groups, but it, it's, it's an organizational tool that we're going to be launching probably around the end of the summer around Greenville to be able to um, help with this process. Like you said, there's just a lot of things out there that are various of so measuring and, and quantifying and, and how to get that all wrapped into something that can be usable to the end user, not only to somebody putting their construction documents together, but somebody who's trying to uh, acquire the products and, and implement and put them into an actual building in a, in a reasonably streamlined fashion similar to the way construction is now and that's uh, those, those are all in development right now too. There's also a lot of uh, 
the uh, the groups that are in all, all these measuring are in the process of looking to each other and, and developing a, a harmonization of uh, of the content and and the delivery. So there's there's a number of um, groups that are looking for this is issue and, and trying to make it easier for the end user. Absolutely. And one, one thing I did forget was the, the Leadership Standards Council does have a universal PCR as well. Um, so there's another group of, as a resource. It's, uh, it's important to realize that it helps nobody if there's an unlimited amount of standards to, to choose from and the organizations that are trying to, in their own way, change how we do things realize that too. So what's been uh, part of the amazing transformation we've seen in the last eight or nine months in particular is, as Wade was uh, talking about, the start of very good communication between these groups and a consolidation of standards or at least a working together of standards. Having a hundred different options to choose from and then vetting which one is most important or simply relying on a system like LEAD to define that for you. And we all know there's some distrust in some of those uh, procedures there. Uh, if we can get it down to a few acceptable standards along the way, it, it helps everybody out. And so uh, you'll see you'll see that evolution happen from now. It'll continue on. Um, I think this year will be a watershed moment for that, simply because of the headway that EPD and um, HPD has had, and then obviously the release of uh, version four, which is reliant on having some sort of accepted standard. Uh, Wade mentioned earlier that um, been working on some language for uh, Division One and the technical sections. I'm wondering if uh, eSpecs or or ARCOM Master Spec BSD have put any language forward yet? Not that I'm aware of. They've been looking to language uh, specifically for being compliant with EAT, and they'll probably be focusing on trying to get that out once uh, LEAD V4 is rolled, they'll probably be a back time on getting that language there and then for, for whatever, you, what ends up happening, they tend to only focus on the, of the uh, delivery, so it becomes a problem and if you need to do a to two or two thousand or a before, where do you get all that information? And then of course now there's the, uh, the living building pallet or there's some others, globes and some other that needs consistent language on what what are the goals and find that information as to how to not only understand the goals but on how to deliver those goals. Uh, Robert or maybe Brent, um, in lead version four, how many credits are impacted um, by the sustainable performance? Um, requirements. It's I know it's much different than version three. Oh, um, I, uh, you're talking about on the material side, right? Uh, yeah. Which ones are going to be looking at the LCA? Uh, I don't have that in front of me. Um, I believe it's six. Uh, maybe Brent can correct me on that. Um, I, th I think it's between. Six. Yeah. Go ahead. I think it's between six and ten because it also kind of rolls into some of the IEQ credits with this. Yeah, so it, it really depends a little bit as we def as they define these. But I think it's between six and ten as a kind of a rule of thumb. Yeah, that's true. That's true. There are the ones that uh, deal with DOC, um, so I guess they, they've been affected a little bit. But uh, in terms of the ones at well. CA. Uh, for example, or for um, transparency, I, I believe mm -hmm. that number is six. Yeah. Yeah, those, those are the new ones. Another phenomenon coming with the before is that what was used to be a credit to be a product are going to become prerequisites, and then the uh, the actual credit will either be enhanced or refined, or even put into a new category. So there's there's some interesting nuances. That it, it's not just a another version of two time but really is a whole new direction on uh, how to be organizing the information that's being uh, sought for for to those uh, goals
We've um, done a, a lead pilot for uh, commercial interiors, and um, based on the marketplace, the, the team just didn't go after the two credits that be impacted. Um, so it's it really is critical to get some tools out there to be able to evaluate products because you know most people aren't trained in this. Oh, I couldn't agree more, and and that's why systems like Green Wizard, um, uh, or at least systems that re that uh, rely on sharing of data, uh, good data between firms. Uh, is so critical to us. Uh, we don't have the time. I, I talked about before the overhead costs alone from this research can kill an entire project. And uh, with such a competitive marketplace right now, it either is going to cause a firm to lose money or it's just not going to get done. And so if we really want to see a market change and a shift in the support that specification writers need, then it, we need to have systems where we're working in a shared Across a shared data way and uh, and uh, and have buy-in from manufacturers and developers like Green Wizard. So critical. Do you, do you see anyone putting um, uh, this into BIM with uh, sustainable attributes uh, so that you can pull them out of the model? I have not heard of that development, but um, my relationship with uh, uh, with those um, uh, the, those software companies, that they'll they'll catch up eventually. Much like uh, we're probably looking at maybe uh, Wade would you agree three to four quarters before we start seeing some of this information um, start showing up in master specs. I think that once uh, lead v4 is actually made official, you'll start seeing uh, Revit. Uh, looking at ways to include that. So they're very reactionary, and it will come down the pike. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. my, my biggest issue there is that it tends to only have either one or the other in there, and that uh, when they moved from 2.2 .2 to 2009, I had to keep a resource of uh, the 2.2 because the new masters didn't include that. And I'm anticipating having to keep three different versions archived in some fashion for a period of time until any of these get sunsetted. Mm -hmm. the, um, on the note about attributes in BIM, I know that the Unified Facilities Guide Specs, um, um, Bill East and uh, the NIBS folks, and uh, I participated in you know pulling attributes out of the 500 of the 700 UFGS sections and sustainability uh, was one, and so they, at least on government projects, they're they're approaching um, um, sustainable attributes in in the model um, the same way they are doing with physical properties, performance properties, so that uh, you know code checking software can can work. Um, Brett, you mentioned before that there was somebody keeping a master list of PCR rules. I didn't write it down. No, I don't, think there's any, I don't think there's any one person. I think we've got a couple resources. As I mentioned, that Leadership Standards Council has a universal PCR. Um, there's a Architecture 2030 has their or 2030 challenge has is working with the industry to develop that standard. I know they're working with the Concrete um, Association to get their that PCR standard for concrete. Um, there is no one repository, one single source. Um, kind of running with that. It, it's, it's kind of broken up by industry. Okay, thank you. And uh, Matt, you said you had some questions from the audience? That is correct. Uh, there's a couple here I'd like to tie in together. Um, from um, Mary Noe, she was wondering, what is the re relationship between using the free to architects and specifiers and the Workflow Pro? Um, however, you know, the definite, you know, describing what those two differences are is too complicated in this presentation. Um, that's fine. I have her email to let you guys be able to contact her directly. And then going off of that, Claudia was wondering as well, um, is there a, a free access um, of some nature to Green Wizard for professional designers, or is it only behind a paywall? That's a great question. It actually is pretty simple. The, the search component of our system is completely free. They can come in with a, a, a public account and search our database of information. 
um, the, really the, the workflow pro or the paywall, if you will, um, falls behind the tool suites that we offer on the back end. At the project level, as um, both Wade and, and Robert alluded to, is building a digital library of that information in your own account, using projects, saving that information down and organizing it at the project level, and then our integration services directly to USGBC. We have a whole suite of tools, basically removing a lot of the need to work in Lean Online to manage. We are a product management database going right into you, feeding all that information directly up into USGBC. All right, and then leading off of that, an additional question here um, stating um, who's responsible for keeping the info up to date? Uh, does Green Wizard audit that info um, by, provided by manufacturers? Or does manufacturers, you know, do they log in when they get information updated? Does it pull automatically from their website? Um, I guess what's the uh, the level of accuracy at any given moment of the content that's on the site? Absolutely. Another good point of clarification. The, the terms and conditions of our site are based on each individual manufacturer managing and inputting the data um, to their own accuracy. We do not load it. We do not manage it. We do not update it. They provide it in multiple formats, they can load it through our application, they can dump files to us, and we can upload that information directly into their account. Um, the accuracy and the update is on two fronts. We do audit the information, if you will. We do go through it. If they send us large files, we do go through it to make sure it's, it's described correctly, but it is not a copy and content marketing-based material because it's individual data fields. It, removes the ability to greenwash the product. It either has a certification with backup documentation or it doesn't. It either got specific data points of information or it does not. Um, so we very much keep that. Um, it's very easy for us to keep it accurate that way. We do send the information. The manufacturers come in on a daily, weekly, monthly basis to make changes, edit. It's a dynamic platform in that sense. At a minimum, in terms of the audit requirement, we do send the information back and paying the manufacturers on a quarterly basis if nothing has changed just to ensure that there are no updates or things to be removed out of the product listings. All righty. When, when, when download came up in your screen before then, that was downloading from the Green Wizard database. It was not going out to the individual manufacturer? You're absolutely correct. Everything is housed in our software, so it's not referencing the manufacturer's website. The product documents are tied to an actual product in the system, to their actual account. So that certainty shade came right from the certainty product that they had loaded into the account. Um, we, it's not referencing many, it's not going to third-party sites or vendors or websites where it becomes dis you know, disjointed again. It's all collected at individual product levels. Okay, we have a, a few additional questions here. Um, one of them here from Francis um, asking, um, are you considering adding the category for what appears in green buildings green spec? Uh, so are you looking at those other potential competitors or additional information and figuring out ways that you can get that information to also tie into what you already collect? Gotcha. Um, so I think they're referencing just uh, putting in a green spec listed or green because they don't really certify products. Um, uh, the green spec is kind of a vetted through building green of kind of pre-selected materials that they've vetted and looked through. Um, certainly something we're open to discuss. I haven't really had a, a lot of feedback from our customers to, to go to that route, but something we're surely open to. Okay. Um, and then this one might be probably more for Mark or Wade. I'm just wondering how does CSI's green format fit into this? Uh, could that be a part of the standardized approach to AEC professionals gathering sustainability info from manufacturers in a consistent way? So I'll, I'll let those other CSI folks on the call potentially answer that question. Well, I, I'm sure Wade will jump in, but uh, this is Mark. Um, uh, green format is not a database. It is, a, in my uh, work with it, it is a, a list of um, uh, sustainability attributes, those people who are providing them, how they're provided, what they, what they mean, but it is, um, it is not a database of 10,000 products. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a tool, it's an organizational and data gathering tool that puts it in a consistent format and that's kind of what CSI does and so we're trying to avoid trying to be a a measuring or evaluate for 
but are trying to make sure that we're providing a, a resource that can be used by all of these entities to that so that the end user will have a consistent uh, format to be looking at. Great. All right. Well, um, one more question, um, maybe Robert or Wade. Do you see your firms are so large? Do you see that the architects or engineers are the early adopters, or, or both? Uh, from our perspective, it's um, and actually I can dig a little deeper. The the people most excited about this are um, twofold. It's our specifications, our primary corporate specifications team. Uh, in our case in Omaha, and our interior design team. It doesn't mean that ultimately our designers in general won't also be pulling from this, but the, uh, generally speaking, when we're looking at healthy materials or some of the uh, lead before credit materials, uh, when you're looking at health and, and transparency, they tend to focus around finishes. Um, so obviously, our specification writers who are trying to support our design teams out there in the most efficient and optimal manner, but then those interior finishes being uh, critical right off the bat. Okay, I, I find that as well that the uh, the interiors people are first seem to be first adopters with the healthy materials. Um, yeah, we're getting the same issue here at, uh, at Smith Group. We we also end up with the uh, the interiors and many of the um, uh, building uh, envelopes also are, are two of the main areas that we're finding a lot of uh, focus on these this criteria. All right. Um, any other uh, final comments? Otherwise, we'll close it out. Uh, Brent, thank you very much. Wade, thank you. Robert, um, as always, uh, Matt, thank you to CSI. I'll look for this presentation on the um, CSI website in a, in a few days, and uh, please tune in again next month. Thank you very much.